Okie dokie. I think we're, uh, we're a couple minutes past, so people are still trickling in, but I think we're going to go ahead and, and get ourselves started. So good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to the Friday seminar series at the Bureau of Economic Geology. Um, I'm really excited today to present uh, Dr. Ben Smith. Ben Smith is currently a postdoc uh, scholar at Caltech, where he studies carbonate sediments in the context of Earth history. His research approaches the stratigraphic record using concepts drawn from process sedimentology, low temperature geochemistry, and geobiology. A proud UT alumnus, Ben completed his PhD at the University of Texas in 2019, Hookham, where he worked with Dr. Charlie Karens in his reservoir characterization research lab. Uh, if y'all, just a few administrative things, if y'all could hold your questions till the end, you're welcome to uh, put them in the chat box or you know, at the end, we can unmute ourselves and, and ask questions, but I would ask you not to ask questions during the talk. And this talk will be about 40 minutes and uh, we'll do questions afterwards. Okay, Ben, rock and roll. All right, let me just share my screen here. All right, how is that? Can everyone see that? Yep, looks good. All right, well, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. Uh, and thank you for that introduction, Kelly. So yeah, my name is Ben Smith. I'm right now, a postdoc at Caltech, but I finished my PhD at UT in 2019. And there's actually a little bit of a personal story here because the material that I'll be talking about today was something that I was introduced to very early on in my graduate career and then just really never touched in any significant way until after I left UT. So it's been fun to kind of circle back to it. It'll be really fun to, to talk to everyone at the Bureau because I was actually introduced to this through you know, cores at the at the BEG core facility. And so so I'd be really interested in getting the perspectives of, you know, people who are st who still are working on those kinds of approaches. So the title of this work is a redox based drowning model for carbonate platforms storing ocean anoxic events. Um, so uh, I'm going to start by kind of explaining what some of those words are. Um, and, and I'm going to start with that kind of big picture earth history perspective, which is that you know, um, oxygen in today's world is ubiquitous. It's one, uh, one of the most common gases in the atmosphere and about 95% of seawater um, has oxygen all the way to the ocean floor. Um, the earth historian's view is that this is, you know, a relatively recent state of affairs. Um, oxygen probably first started accumulating around, you know, 2.1 billion years ago. In, Earth's, uh, in Earth's atmosphere. And then it was probably wasn't until just before the Phanerozoic that we started getting a lot of oxygen um, all the way to the bottom of the ocean. And so an ocean anoxic event is, is really a short-term reversal in this trend. Uh, the long-term trend is, is one of increasing oxygen in Earth's atmospheres and oceans. And there's brief periods in the Phanerozoic where this trend reverses. And we never really go all the way back to the world of the Precambrian, but it, it is this kind of interesting reversal. Um, and these reversals have a lot of important implications, both for academic research and for uh, petroleum systems and applied research. Um, so like a, a classic review paper or a set of models will, will probably look something like this. You'll get like a, a little sketch. Um, these events are usually triggered by volcanism. There's a kind of an outgassing of volatiles like uh, CO2 and, and sulfur species. And then there's a, just a bunch of arrows that show exchange between the atmosphere and the oceans and Earth's weathering feedbacks. And so a lot of times you'll see this drawn as, a, as kind of a, this web or, or diagram where you have this volcanic eruption of CO2. And then there's this cascade of feedbacks. And you could trace all the, the arrows through these little boxes. Um, but it's complicated. And, and one of the reasons people are really interested in this is because it touches on almost every important Earth surface process or system. It touches on climate, weathering, uh, feedbacks between you know, burial of organic matter and Earth's redox species. And, and I think that's part of the promise of why we study these events is if we can understand what's going on at ocean anoxic events, that indicates we have a pretty good understanding of how these systems are linked. And that has applications both for modern climate research and for understanding the habitability of our planet in deep time. Um, there's also a, um, a kind of an applied perspective because a lot of these deposits um, are important for both conventional and unconventional petroleum systems. And I know that's a big focus of um, a lot of the research groups at uh, the BEG, and that's actually how I was introduced to the problem as well. So this diagram here is kind of a summary diagram from another PhD student who finished at UT, 
And he was really interested in kind of shallow water carbonate systems and how they respond to these ocean anoxic events. And so kind of the classic signature in these carbonate environments is that during an ocean anoxic event, we're gonna replace some of these shallow water carbonates with fine grain organic rich deposits. And that, you know, that, that should somehow correlate with the geochemical changes that are indicative of this, this web of persistent feedbacks. And, and these organic rich deposits in the context of a conventional petroleum system, they could be a source uh, for petroleum or they could seal underlying carbonate reservoirs. So, and then just kind of a little bit of background, it's like, okay, so we've got this web of feedbacks of surface processes, but what we're usually left with is a, a series of sedimentary rocks. And so um, part of this game is trying to figure out what we can pull out of the rock record and, and how it has to do with these processes. And when it comes to organic matter burial, most people are interested in redox, you know, the change of, of redox species within Earth's oceans. Um, and so just kind of remember that that involves um, electron equivalents, you know, and it usually involves something like sulfur or transition metals that can have multiple valence states. And the way we do that is when the valence state of these, um, these atoms changes, it'll slot into different minerals and those minerals have different solubility. So someone like Tody Larson, um, you know, will work with a technique like X-ray fluorescence, and then it'll kind of look for changes in these trace elements that are correlated with changes in mineralogy and by proxy, you know, changes in redox. And so that's a, that's a huge part of these events and it's usually related to organic matter. And then kind of return to this diagram, it, this kind of, again, highlights how linked these systems are, which is like, okay, what's the pathway that connects uh, redox changes in organic matter burial to this, this kind of CO2 volcanism story? Um, it's actually really complicated. And if I was to, to trace a path on one of these kind of summary web figures, it would be like, okay, I inject a bunch of CO2 in the atmosphere, that changes Earth's climate system, including its temperature and precipitation. That changes the weathering on the continents. That brings a lot of nutrients into the ocean, which triggers a bunch of uh, primary production um, of organic material. Some of that organic material is buried. And then in an effort to consume that material, microbes exhaust oxygen in the ocean. And so that's really, really complicated. And you could spend you know, a lot of time trying to work out the individual parts of these pathways. And you also get a sense that this is a little bit of a multiple choice history. I could have maybe traced a different path. And so part of the challenge is, you know, okay, which of these, you know, pathways are the most important? Um, how do I judge between pathways? And then there's also this geologic perspective of, you know, that diagram doesn't really give me a sense of time or of how strong those processes are. And so usually there's, there's other approaches that we use to fill in some of this information. And, and the one we'll be talking about today is numerical box modeling. And so the, the way these box models are set up is they're almost like a toy um, uh, that, that kind of shows how the earth system responds to changes. And so I kind of think of it like a guitar string. You pluck the guitar string and then the vibrations kind of ripple out. And so the, the way these are usually set up is you have a, um, a set of fluxes and you want to transform, you want to somehow transform those um, into these, these plots that have time on one axis and then some, something that's measurable within the stratigraphic record on another axis. So this is um, an excerpt from a, a famous set of studies from Penn State. And, and they, what they've done is they've taken this atmospheric PCO2 as their input, and they're using this link system to describe, you know, if I perturb the atmosphere CO2, how is that gonna affect carbon isotopes in carbonates and organic matter? Because those are two things I can measure in the rock record. And so the way I think of this is numerical models give me a sense of how much, and then they give me a sense of how long, you know, what kind of timescales do these processes operate over, and can I match that to the timescale that I'm seeing in the stratigraphic record? And so I would say the majority of OAE, what OAE is the acronym for these ocean NOx events, the majority of OAE research is, has really been focused on the organic matter side of it. But there's this other part of the story in these shallow water carbonate environments and that the carbonate system is also affected. Um, and that's what I wanna talk about today. And, and specifically, I wanna talk about this, this pattern where just prior to this, these uh, fine grain deposits kind of being deposited on top of these platforms, there's usually this pattern of backstepping and drowning. And this is usually so sometimes called carbonate collapse 
or, or um, platform drowning. And this was really first outlined in a series of kind of seminal papers in the 80s. And this was kind of the height of uh, when secret stratigraphy was kind of first coming into its kind of, kind of coming into its own as a discipline. And there's a paper by uh, Wolfgang Schlager where he outlines what he calls the paradox of drowned reefs and platforms. Um, and Schlager was, uh, was working in Miami. He was doing a lot of work on modern carbonate systems and Pleistocene carbonate systems, both in Great Bahama Bank and Florida. And he had kind of done some work measuring sedimentation rates in these environments. And he ran into this problem where if he measured sedimentation rates either in modern platforms or in ancient platforms, and he tried to balance that, um, when he tried to balance that against the rate at which new space was being created for sediments, he, in his opinion, um, the sedimentation rates were so high that it would be very, very difficult to generate these backstepping patterns through things like subsidence, uh, tectonics, or sea level change. And so he, he suggested that maybe uh, the solution for some of these drowning events was to play with the sedimentation rate and to look for feedbacks that would damage the way that carbonate is precipitated in the ocean. Um, and, and so that kind of brings us to the second aspect of this, which is, you know, a lot of the uh, research into um, OAEs has been on the kind of redox side of things, but there's also this acid-base chemistry of seawater, which is very difficult uh, to work with geologically because there aren't really good pH proxies, but it's, it's important for, for carbonates. And if, you, if you're not... Um, you're not well versed in chemistry or you kind of don't remember your, um, your kind of geology classes. The, the way I think of this is, you know, if you have an introductory uh, lab or field geology course, uh, one of the first, one of the things they'll ask you to do is they'll ask you to identify limestone. And the typical way you do that is you'll drop a little bit of dilute HCl on that. And so, so if you can remember for the rest of the talk that, uh, you know, you know, dropping acid uh, is bad for carbonates, then, you know, we'll be able to get through some of the, the chemistry in this talk. And so that kind of brings us again to this, this idea of a multiple choice history, which is, you know, what are, you know, in that kind of complicated web diagram, which of those arms or feedback loops that I trace could, could reasonably damage the carbonate system? And I think there's at least three, three proposed mechanisms. One has to do with uh, nutrient poisoning, which I think, unfortunately, we won't talk about today. But the other two I want to talk about are ocean acidification and then a kind of a mechanism based on microbial metabolisms, which is you know, what we've proposed in this work. So let's start with ocean acidification. Um, this, this has been a really popular hypothesis for about the past 15 years. And, and again, it speaks to the interdisciplinary nature of this research because a lot of these concepts have been um, borrowed from modern climate change literature. Um, I think what people do is they look at this, they say, oh, okay, well, uh, the volcanoes release CO2 and rapid CO2 in injection is also you know, going on in today's world. So what are the kind of feedbacks that will happen? And so if you open up a news article about ocean acidification, it's gonna look something like this which is that CO2 acts as a, as a weak acid in water. So CO2 that's injected in the atmosphere will make its way into the surface ocean. It'll react with a water molecule and it'll produce another carbonate species and a proton. And so that's like on the surface, that's actually, that's pretty straightforward. It, it gives me a very direct connection between the, the underlying trigger for these events and the stratigraphic record. And so I, I just want to point out, this will not actually dissolve carbonate because the ocean is precipitating carbonate. But usually what will happen is this will slow the rate at which carbonates are precipitated. So from the perspective of platform drowning, if I'm slowing the, the precipitation rate, that actually may produce this kind of backstepping pattern because I can no longer keep up with the background subsidence. Great, so that's kind of the qualitative understanding. So, so again, I wanna turn to this tool of box modeling, which is usually the next step, which is, all right, I wanna use a box model to answer two questions, which is like, how long? and how much. And this is where I think I start to run into problems with this ocean acidification mechanism. Um, so this is uh, from a paper in 2012. It's a, it's a series of box model outputs. The horizontal axis here is time. And I, I wanna point out that this is a log scale. So, so this is 10 years, 100 years. So this is about the human time scales that are usually considered in, uh, in climate change research. And then once we get up to here, 10,000, 100,000 years, 
Uh, a million years, which is very relevant for stratigraphic research, is going to be off this plot. But, but there's kind of this issue of, of time scale. And so the, the way this model works is that they double the atmospheric CO2, and then they're using this capital Greek letter omega, which is a, a measure of how um, favorable or unfavorable carbonate precipitation is in the ocean. And they're, they're seeing how the surface ocean responds to this change. And so in the, in the red models here, they're doubling CO2 very, very quickly um, over 10 years or so. And in the blue model, they're, they're doubling CO2 at a much slower rate. And in all cases, there are other feedbacks within that web that start to push the ocean back to its starting condition. And the, the kind of thing about this is, is, you know, I can damage the carbonate system by injecting a lot of CO2 very quickly, but that means the time scale of recovery is also going to be fast, at least geologically speaking. And by the time, by the time I'm getting out to about 10,000 years, I've actually, I'm well on my way to restoring the ocean to its starting state. And that's actually a really big problem for me. And, and again, this is PhD work that was done at the University of Texas. This is called a Wheeler diagram. Um, the, the horizontal axis here is not thickness, but it's in time. And this shows the, the uh, kind of the ages and times associated with some of these platform drowning events. And again, here, the, the brown is usually fine grain material, probably organic rich. And you can see that, you know, a lot of these are on the scale of millions of years, you know, probably a million years or five million years. And, and I always had this problem with this because, you know, that's, that's, too, that's too long for the time scale of ocean acidification that's suggested by a lot of these box models. Okay, there's also a secondary problem with this, which is that um, ocean acidification is a very strict hypothesis about timing and how it correlates, how the stratigraphic record correlates with the geochemical record. What I mean by that is the atmosphere and oceans tend to be very well mixed with respect to carbon on kind of hundreds of years and thousands of year timescales. And so one of the things that jumps out about to me about this diagram is a lot of these drowning events are not correlative with each other. You know, the, the onset might be delayed or there might be, you know, areas like in Italy where we don't actually see drowning in the sense of these fine grain deposits making their way up onto the platform top. And so again, I, I just kind of, it just kind of bothers me that that um, you know the the ocean acidification story has this this kind of really nice appeal to it, but it I think there's room for at least one other mechanism. And so so that's why I want to kind of highlight what we did in this work, which is we looked at um, another way at which you might generate drowning based on microbial metabolisms. And and so whereas the ocean acidification story kind of looks forward. Uh, and, and takes elements from modern climate change and tries to pro project those into the past. This microbial metabolism story actually looks backwards. And it looks back to that period of Earth history and the Precambrian where there wasn't a lot of oxygen in Earth's atmospheres and oceans and, and tries to maybe grab something of use out of that and then use it during these short term reversals in the Phanerozoic. And so, so I apologize for springing this on you early in the morning, but the, the way this usually works is. Um, all these metabolisms are both acid-base reactions and redox reactions. That's important in terms of what we discussed earlier because the redox reaction part of this is what we know or what we think we understand really well about um, the ocean's chemistry during the, these time periods. And so the kind of promise with this is that, hey, if, if these redox reactions are changing because of microbial metabolisms, that also implies an acid and base change. And so you know, I apologize for these, but the, the way this usually works is we take these, um, these kind of tables and then we, we plot them on, on a bivariate plot and then we, we represent each of the re these reactions as a vector. So the way these plots work is they have a horizontal axis that um, is an accounting of mass balance for carbon species. They have a, a vertical axis that has something to do with charge balance. And then the, the vector shows the pathway for each one of these reactions and says, okay, if I respire a certain amount of organic carbon and convert it to an inorganic species like CO2, how much change do I get in the charge balance of seawater that accompanies that? And what does that mean for the carbonate system? Again, I'm, I'm using this capital Greek letter omega, which is a measure of how favorable or unfavorable carbonate precipitation reactions are. And the answer is it actually really depends on which reaction pathway you're using. And the, the really important ones here are this dark blue arrow which is aerobic respiration. And so in the presence of oxygen, respiring organic matter 
pushes um, makes a vector path that pushes you towards lower contours of omega. And so you, usually you'll see this in studies of like early diagenetic environments where organic matter is breaking down in the presence of oxygen. It tends to prevent carbonate cements from forming. And in contrast to that, anaerobic processes or processes that use an electron acceptor besides oxygen tend to increase the saturation state. And so the, the one we'll be talking about today is um, sulfate reduction. And so that's actually, so, so the kind of idea here is that, well, if the oceans are changing their redox state during ocean anoxic events, and that redox state correlates with changes in microbial metabolisms, that implies that the acid-base chemistry is changing in a way that we can reasonably guess at or model. Sorry, this, this is just a little side box about this, again, this capital uh, Greek letter omega. It's the saturation state with respect to carbonate minerals. When that number is less than one, carbonate will dissolve. And when it's larger than one, carbonates precipitate. And then the, you know, the value, the degree to which it's larger than one implies something about how fast or slow that reaction is. So just before we go on, you, you might ask the question, is there, is there independent evidence that these redox changes in the ocean are coupled to changes in microbial metabolisms? And I would say yes. And, and the, the kind of data set that I turn to is a lot of these biomarker studies, which are showing that these uh, changes in trace elements that suggest redox changes are also coupled to changes in biomarkers that suggest different microbial metabolisms. And the one that I've kind of seen come to light over the past 15 years or so are these biomarkers um, derived from green sulfur bacteria. And so the way these green sulfur bacteria work is they need a source of sulfide and then they need sunlight because they're doing photosynthesis, just not photosynthesis like you learned in school that produces oxygen. And so the kind of trick with these is I need both light and hydrogen sulfide. And, and those, those two things would not be coincident in most of the modern ocean. The typical place you find these is like in nasty hot spring environments where water, anoxic water is bubbling up from underground and then it's being exposed to sunlight very quickly. You don't expect to find it in the ocean. And yet for a lot of these ocean anoxic events like OAE2, they're finding evidence of green sulfur bacteria in marine sediments. And so the typical interpretation of that is that I have a very large pocket of sulfitic water and the top of that pocket is actually extending up into the photic zone. And so again, I just wanna like come back to this idea of, of how we're gonna treat this in this box model, which is, you know, we've got this, we've got these set of microbial uh, metabolisms. They, they are both redox reactions and acid base reactions. And the idea is if I'm turning that knob during an OAE and I'm changing the, the redox, this implies that that also must change the acid and base chemistry. So let's move to the setup of this box model. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a, we're going to modify some pre-existing box models that are, are usually used um, for like modern chemical oceanography research. And so the, the kind of first thing that these models have to do is they, they have to have a steady state. What I mean by that is that the inputs and outputs are balanced. So, so for an ocean model, there's usually a weathering input where a material is coming into the ocean, a dissolved material is coming into the ocean through rivers and runoff. and then Every year there's a budget of weathering and then the same amount of material has to leave the ocean. So for something like carbon, you know, uh, inorganic carbon species might make their way into the ocean. And then every year the Earth's carbonate budget and its organic matter budget need to be balanced so that we don't have a runaway system where the, um, you know, concentrations within this box increase or decrease forever, you know. So usually the starting assumption is one of steady state. Um, here, I've, I've labeled the weathering uh, A in for alkalinity. Um, usually, we, we start by balancing uh, kind of the weak bases that are being brought in to seawater through weathering. And so this is typically the way this is written, which is, which is like A in equals A out. These outputs need to be balanced. However, there's this kind of like wrinkle in there that there's internal fluxes. If I have more than one box in this box model, there can be movement between those boxes that, that you know, don't necessarily upset the balance between inputs and outputs. And, and if you talk to a chemical oceanographer, they'll tell you that, you know, if I have this weathering budget of alkalinity, about four times as much alkalinity leaves the surface ocean as comes in every year. 
And a lot of that leaves either as carbonate platforms or as these, these kind of little coccolith chalks. And so, so the kind of the way this works is, okay, if, I'm, if I have four times as much alkalinity leaving as comes in, I need to somehow return most of that to the ocean before it reaches the rock record. And that's, that's actually what happens, which is the deep ocean actually dissolves carbonate quite efficiently. And so of this four times flux that, that leaves the surface ocean, about three times, of, uh, three, uh, times the weathering input is redissolved. Okay, so what we did is we decided we, we wanted to, uh, sorry, let me, go, let me go back for a second. So this, this answer is non-unique. I started with four because that's what the modern system suggests, but there are other combinations that would give you the same A in equals e, A out. And that's what we wanted to explore, which is, you know, okay, if I change the way that carbonate is dissolved in the deep ocean, will that, you know, make a new balance between uh, the, two, the two boxes? So what we did is we worked from a pre-existing box model. Uh, this is from Kristen Bergman's work at MIT. And, and she had kind of come up with a, a, a box model that, again, drawing from the past, uh, her work was really focused on the Proterozoic and, and trying to understand how microbial metabolisms would work across two boxes, in this case, the, the sediment water interface. So I, I don't you know, really think it's helpful to go over the equations too much, except that I'll point out the, the term that we'll be talking about here, um, which is this capital Greek delta. And, and in our model, that's the knob that we're turning that represents the microbial metabolisms. So the way we're going to set this up is we're going to we're going to let this model run at steady state, and the starting value of this capital Greek delta represents an ocean that's full of oxygen, where almost all organic matter is being respired with oxygen as a primary electron acceptor. And again, that implies a certain pathway and a certain ratio between mass and charge balance contributed when I respire that organic matter. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to simulate an ocean anoxic event by turning that knob and, and representing a mixture of oxygen and another process like sulfate reduction. And so what we found is, you know, when we, when we set up this box model, changing the, without, without changing anything else, changing the, uh, the way that we're representing microbial metabolisms uh, actually changed the way that carbonates were precipitated and dissolved between the two boxes. So here I have this capital Greek letter omega. And the, there's two curves here. The blue curve is for the surface ocean. So that's that top box in the model. And the red curve is for the deep ocean. And so in the, in the starting state in a world with, without oxygen, the distance between um, the saturation state and the surface ocean and the deep ocean is, is very large. Uh, there's a very high saturation state in the surface ocean that's balanced by a very low saturation state. And, and if we kind of cast that in terms of fluxes, that's the situation where I'm producing four times as much carbonate as I need to produce in the surface ocean, and I'm dissolving three times as much. During the ocean anoxic event, um, these, the contributions of these anaerobic mi uh, microbial processes actually reduce the dissolution in the deep ocean. And what happens is the, the um, kind of fluxes in the surface ocean eventually reduce to match that. And so the sum of the sum of these two curves, actually the difference between these two curves is always one. So th this is normalized that weathering input flux. And so this is kind of that expression of multiple valid steady states. And the, the most important part of this, um, the, the most important part of this model is the fact that, you know, I have kind of assigned an arbitrary time scale to this OAE, but you'll notice that the, the shape of the input curve pretty much exactly matches the shape of the output curve. And what I wanna do is I wanna contrast that to the, the ocean acidification model because what we saw there is if I disturb the system, there are very, very strong negative feedbacks that start to push the system back to its starting state. And the, the kind of drowning mechanism we're proponing, proposing here doesn't do that. And in fact, the ocean only returns to its starting state once I flip that knob back to its starting condition. And so what this means is that this operates over arbitrarily long timescales. If I had chosen to make this OAE a million years, then this carbonate, these carbonate fluxes would have persisted for a million years. And what it does is it effectively couples this very short-term carbon cycle at Earth's surface 
to Earth's very long-term redox cycle, which tends to operate at these longer timescales that, that kind of match what we see in the stratigraphic record. And again, I just like this is I just want to point out this is this is all motivated by stratigraphy. You know, this is motivated by the stratigraphic record of these events. And so to, to me at least, this checks at least one box, which is that this process is capable of operating over the long time scales that we see for these surrounding events in the stratigraphic record. Um, what I didn't cover today and what isn't really covered in this model is that, you know, although we chose to represent the entire ocean as two boxes, we could have subdivided that further. And so that kind of gets at this secondary issue of, well, you know, a lot of these drowning events are not synchronous. And so, you know, that I, I kind of picked on that for the ocean acidification model. I would say that our proposed process might actually be able to generate this if we were to subdivide that model into boxes for different ocean basins. And so I, th I think there's a, a kind of a promise that, you know, this, this might actually better match the heterogeneity and time scales of the stratigraphic record. Okay, so kind of the last thing we did is we wanted to generate a series of steady state solutions. Um, so, you know, we, we said that the time variant solution uh, tends to go towards a new steady state. And so, you know, what I wanted to do here is really distill everything uh, into a curve or a set of curves that I could use to explain platform drowning. And so what we have here is we have a new horizontal axis, which is the, uh, the amount of oxygen that's been replaced by sulfate as a primary electron acceptor. And here, I'm gonna make the argument that that's roughly analogous to the percent of sea, the seafloor that's covered by these anoxic water masses. And that's actually something, I wouldn't say it's known from the stratigraphic record, but those are things that people have estimated using different trace element systems, isotope systems, and biomarkers. And so what I did is I kind of dug through the literature and I found estimates going from about 8%, you know, or a couple percent to maybe 10% of, uh, you know, the seafloor covered by anoxic water masses. And then if you use the biomarker data, that suggests maybe even 50% of the ocean's floor during ocean anoxic event two was covered by these anoxic water masses. And what I've done here is I've plotted the kind of difference between the surface ocean and the deep ocean as a function of how much of the ocean's floor is covered by anoxic water masses. So I would say that the, left, uh, the leftmost side here is, is a representation of what our earth looks like today, where virtually all of the ocean's floor is covered by oxygen. And then the right here would be the latest Precambrian, where we think there's you know, still very little oxygen in Earth's oceans, and that most organic matter is being respired by sulfate reduction. And so, again, I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I don't think it's possible to go all the way back to the Precambrian during these short-term reversals, but you, you start to get there. And, and what this plot does is it kind of quantifies how far along that process you are and what that means for the surface ocean and the deep ocean. And so, this blue curve here is the, is the surface ocean. And so it starts at a four times overproduction of carbonate, which is again, based on kind of modern chemical oceanography. And as I start to increase the, the coverage of the seafloor, the amount of the seafloor that's covered by anoxic water masses, I actually decrease the carbonate sedimentation rate. And so, you know, what I would, what I would do is I would look at this and I would say, that's a, a, a valid explanation for platform drowning. You know, if I'm, if I'm, trying to kill these platforms by taking away their ability to keep up with the background subsidence rate, then this is a valid mechanism for that. And I, and I want to point out one last thing, which is that the shape of these curves is slightly concave up. And what that means to me is that you actually get the greatest rate of change. You get the most damage to the carbonate system during the early spread of anoxia. So just kind of a summary, you know, this study is really kind of a proof of concept. You know, just kind of tugging, using a box model to tug at the strings that connect different parts of the Earth, the Earth system, and then just like a, a gut check of whether this is, a, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, looks like some of the things we see in the stratigraphic record. So again, redox drowning leverages this kind of intrinsic link between Earth's acid base system and its redox system, which is provided by microbial metabolism. Um, the, the mechanism that we're talking about is, is quasi steady state and it operates over arbitrarily long timescales, which is good because it helps us match those kind of 100,000 year and million year timescales of stratigraphic record. And then this last part 
is not really something we did in this study, although we suggested it at the, kind of at the end of our paper, which is, you know, here we're really considering only two boxes, which is this well-mixed surface ocean and this well-mixed deep ocean. But if I was to subdivide that into different ocean basins for like the Tethys versus, you know, you know, different kind of sub basins, I might be able to sustain different curves in those different basins. And that might kind of act to produce this differential drowning record that, that is different, you know, both between basins and maybe within this, the same basin. Okay, so with that, I just wanna take a little bit of time to talk about, you know, what's next? Like, what, what are the kind of takeaways from this from both the applied petroleum systems perspective and then from the earth history perspective? Um, so I, I kind of started this talk and, and my background um, during my PhD was mostly in the kind of large scale stratigraphic architecture of these carbonate platforms. And that was the motivation for this. And, and the, the project, I would say we didn't really get all the way there. But, but the way that I would pitch this is, um, you know, there's, there's different kinds of models. Uh, one kind of modeling that's done for these, these events is this geochemical modeling of anoxic water masses. This is from a, what's called an inter intermediate complexity earth model. And they're, they're trying to, the warm areas here are where they think there was anoxic water masses during OAE2. And then on the right here, I have a totally different kind of model, which is a stratigraphic forward model where people, you know, they impose a sedimentation rate, they impose different subsidence rates and sea level change history, and they try to match the architecture of stratigraphic packages, you know, based on these models. And, and it, it's always a challenge to do these in carbonates because, you know, it's easy to impose a uh, tectonics history or sea level change history, but the idea of changing the carbonate sedimentation rate and how that responds quantitatively to the to changes chemical changes in the ocean, I think is not well understood. And so what I would do is, you know, I would propose this study as an intermediary that kind of sits in between these two approaches. It doesn't really get all the way to stratigraphic architecture, but what you can imagine doing is saying, okay, I'm gonna take the output of one study, which is the amount of seafloor that's covered by anoxic water masses. I'm gonna trace where that sits on this plot. And then I'm gonna come into this stratigraphic modeling program and I'm gonna simulate an OAE by reducing the carbonate sedimentation rate by specific amount. So for OAE2, I would like look at this study for OAE2, I would say, you know, I've covered up the name here, but Montero et al. suggested that at the peak of OAE2, 50% of the ocean floor was covered by sulfitic water masses. I come here on this plot and I say, that's about a 50% reduction in the carbonate sedimentation rate in the surface ocean. And then I would come into my stratigraphic modeling program and say, you know, what happens to the stratigraphic architecture of these platforms if I halfway through this run cut the sedimentation rate by 50%? You know, what kind of patterns and geometries and scales are associated with that? And then, you know, is that starting to get at what I see in the stratigraphic record and kind of the seismic scale architecture of these platforms? Um, another really, really interesting takeaway that I got from this is, again, you know, this is leveraging the kind of redox history and the part of the OAEs we think we know really well. And, you know, again, my background is mostly in carbonates, but I found myself, you know, looking at biomarkers. I found myself thinking about organic matter. And, and I think this is a really interesting thing for the, for the Bureau of Economic Geology, because you have all these like these interconnected research groups. And there's, you know, people here like uh, Bob, who's made an entire career of understanding both carbonates and mud rocks. But but I found myself wanting to leverage um, material from the kind of mud rock uh, and unconventional literature to help me understand carbonates. And so, you know, when we come back to this idea of, okay, if I have a stratigraphic package that I think is related to an OAE, how am I going to tell that apart from a, a drowning that's related te to tectonics or uh, to sea level? And I would say, well, show me what the biomarkers are doing in the basin, because th this particular model that we're proposing is very much connected to microbial metabolisms. And what, you know, the first thing I'd want to see if someone was to apply this model would be show me biomarkers that, that are saying not only is the redox changing, that the microbial communities are along for the ride and they're also changing. And, and I think it's really interesting that the Bureau has the relevant expertise, both in carbonate systems and in kind of mud rocks and biomarkers to, to kind of make these studies work. Okay, and so the last kind of element here 
is again, I want to, I want to return to this earth history aspect because that's, that's my research. That's what I'm passionate about. Um, and so, you know, one of the things you always have to do with these models is you, is you have to ask what assumptions you made and you have to ask, you know, when are those assumptions going to be valid and when are they going to be violated or, or invalid? And so one of the things that was, was uh, we really leaned on for this was again, this, this idea that the modern ocean has this four times overproduction of carbonate and that a large amount of that carbonate gets exported to the deep ocean where it can be redissolved. And the way I've interpreted this is that a large part of that flux is in coccolith chocks. You know, it's, it's, it's not all in carbonate platforms, a lot of it's in coccoliths. And so then there's this evolutionary question of, well, wait a minute, you know, when, when did coccoliths first appear? Um, they actually didn't appear, you know, at the, you know, advent of animal life in the latest Precambrian. They actually appear about halfway through the Phanerozoic. And this is something that people have picked on quite a bit. Um, and, and this is a review paper uh, from Hugh Jenkins, where he's talking about ocean anoxic events. And he kind of highlights the four major ones of the, the Phanerozoic, which are the early Tawartian, uh, the early Aptian, OAE1A, there's another 1B event, and it's OAE2. And of these four events, only the early Tawartian event is associated with a, with a mass extinction and a large amount of biotic tur turnover. And people have really harped on this, that you know, these other oceanoxic events are, I mean, they're re really big disturbances of the earth system, but there's something different about them. You know, the biotic change is, is less. Um, and people have pointed to these coccoliths and said, actually the appearance of these coccoliths sometime, or the, the spread of these coccoliths during the, the mid Mesozoic marks a fundamental difference between the way the earth handles these disturbances between the early Mesozoic and Paleozoic and then the kind of later Mesozoic and Cenozoic. And so, so from the perspective of what we're proposing here, you know, I, I, would, I would ask myself, and I still ask myself, does redox drowning work for platforms of all ages? You know, do I want to go to the Devonian and use this for a Kelwasser event or, or something like that? Or is what we've outlined really a distinctly Mesozoic flavor of stratigraphic packaging that, that is only really valid for, for like a short period of Earth history? and helps explain some of the differences between events that, that nominally share the same trigger, which is this, this volcanism, but seem to be expressed differently within the, the, the rock record. And that is all I have for now, and I'm, I'm happy to, to take questions. Uh, Kelly, if there's any questions. Thanks for a really cool talk, Ben. Uh, Y'all, if you want to put questions in the chat or if you would um, you know, like to unmute yourselves, uh, just go for it. Hey, Ben. It's Odie here. This is great, great talk. Hey. Got a question for you. All right. So with the... Um, I was trying to think with the, with your box model, like the, the non-synchronous um, drowning of the carbonate platforms. Is that, I mean, is that an indication that it's just not like the ocean's not well mixed with respect to uh, alkalinity? And do you think you can, or is it just, is there, is it, is it not just like one event that kicks off drowning? You know, are there multiple events? I think okay. your, uh, your box model approach could, Kind of highlight at least identify like what you think the key process is and then get that and what's the time frame difference you know is it like a hundred thousand years or like two million year difference between these uh platform droughtings around the world it's a good question so so let me see if i can uh find a find a relevant slide here uh real quick so yeah so tony's question is about the time scale of these drownings and then the differences between different regions of the world and i i kind of harped on the idea that like the the carbon system in uh, seawater sea tends to be relatively well mixed and, and, and that uh, a disturbance to the atmosphere will percolate into the ocean very quickly. Um, one thing that I would point out is that in, in the modern ocean, uh, there's differences in the depth between the carbonate compensation depth uh, between like the Pacific and the Atlantic. And, and I think that's actually indicative of what we're talking about here because the differences in those are not gonna be related to pressure temperature gradients. Like, I don't think those make that much of a difference. They're really gonna be related to the organic matter flux and, you know, like how, you know, 
organic matter is being respired. Um, and again, remember that that um, aerobic respiration is is bad for carbonates. You know, it'll either if if you're super saturated, it'll lead to slower rates, and if you're undersaturated, it'll lead to faster dissolution rates. So that I think this um, some chemical oceanography research that suggests that the depth of that CCD in different ocean basins is related to the organic matter flux and, and how organic matter is being respired. And so I would, I would consider this kind of a, an extension of that, you know, saying that, you know, even in our modern ocean, differences in the local organic matter flux seem to drive differences in carbonate di dissolution with depth. And all we're doing is we're, we're playing, we're kind of playing based on that. And, and I, I don't see any reason why those kind of those differences would disappear when we start adding different metabolisms. Is that, is that answer enough for your question? Yeah, no, that's good. I like that idea that sort of are the mud rocks chasing the carbonates or the carbonates chasing the mud rocks. Yeah, I, I, I will add one other thing of interest and it's something that's just not touched on in this talk at all. And I, I'm sure some people are interested in it. You know, there's plenty of drowning events during the Cretaceous that don't seem to line up with a ocean anoxic event. And, and, I, and I also think about, you know, like uh, Ahmed Alnawi's PhD and some of the work that you and you and Bob had done with him, where for OAE2, it's like the best, the best you know, organic matter and the highest uh, trace elements enrichments are actually below the ocean anox event. And so like, I, I still struggle with that. You know, the, the, the match between the geochemical and the physical records is rarely as clean as we would like it to be. And, and so I don't think this model totally solves that, but it, it at least tries to grapple with that saying like, you know, how can we make spatial and temporal differences, you know, be, between these different ocean basins that, that give you some wiggle room for how the stratigraphic record and the geochemical records are gonna match up. I think Richard's question in the uh, chat box goes right into that. Yeah, so uh, Richard Den says the drowning of the Buda platform occurred around 97.5 million years, uh, several million years prior to OAE2. Yeah, uh, that's a great observation. Um, so yeah, a lot of the carbonates in the Gulf Coast drown, you know, way before OAE2. It's possible they're, co they're coincident with this OAE 1D, but I, I, it, it doesn't really matter. It's a, it's a very valid concern, which is OAE 1D is a smaller event. And even if you were to correlate it, you still have this problem of, okay, well, why isn't OAE 1D knocking out carbonate platforms in Italy? And then what does it even, what does it even mean if you have an ocean anoxic event, which is like usually defined as a global phenomenon? What does it mean when you have like OAE 1D or OAE 3 or some of these OAEs that people argue about whether they're regionally expressed or not? Um, and again, I, I do think that there is a little bit of flexibility within this model, which is like, you know, it, it actually doesn't have to be an ocean anoxic event. And one of the things that showed up in this the biomarker studies was like, yeah, there's a change in biomarkers associated with OAEs. There's also sometimes evidence of these biomarkers showing up just in regular Cretaceous sediments above or below the event. And so, so one possibility that I'll, I'll throw out there with you know, very little to substantiate it is that in, in these greenhouse in worlds, when you have kind of slow ocean circulation, you don't have ice caps to drive ocean circulation, there may just be pockets of anoxic water hanging around. You know, they don't all need to be correlated with these ocean anoxic events. And then, so you might just be kind of sliding up and down this curve as those pockets kind of appear and disappear and there's other processes that are changing circulation. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I do appreciate this idea that it's, it's probably harmful to try to like use a hammer to hammer everything and make it fit into an ocean anoxic event when there's clearly, um, you know, other processes going on that, that also drive carbonate platform grounding. And so, yeah, again, I would say, I'd be interested in the biomarkers in the Buda. You know, are there biomarkers associated with changing microbial metabolisms? If so, great. If not, that's a, a sign that it's time to move on and this is not the, the model you wanna be applying. 
Uh, to, to follow up on that, he says, we found that the concretionary layers in the Eagleford were preferentially bioturbated versus the organic rich layers, which we also attribute to microbial related changes and sediment alkalinity changes. So I think you're on the right track. Right on. Okay, cool. Um, I would love to talk to you about that more. If you have time, I, I'd love to, to meet with you after the talk. Yeah, there are still um, a couple slots right after the talk available. So, uh, okay. So going, going back to a question from Ali Abraham, uh, Ali Abraham, sorry. Um, they say, thanks for the talk. And if the oceans recover quickly from acidification, what mechanism explains prolonged anoxia or ocean acidification? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, my understanding is that most of the anoxia, let me see if I can go back here. Most of the anoxia is going to follow the same route as organic matter. And so, so it's going to follow this time scale of weathering feedbacks. So the CO2, like, you know, triggers this weathering feedback that, that you know, increases um, the, the delivery of, of nutrients to the ocean. So it's going to follow this arm right here which goes with the time scale of organic matter enrichment and oxygen budgets. What I'm, what I'm less good at is, is that there are characteristic time scales associated with all of Earth's geochemical cycles. And I'm told that the oxygen and redox budgets tend to evolve on million year time scales and that the carbon budgets, like if, I'm, if I have a carbon budget that doesn't interact with redox, like this ocean acidification story, those tend to evolve on very short time scales. And so that's, that's a part of the interdisciplinary aspect that's just a little outside my, my wheelhouse, but I think with um, some work, I, I could maybe dig up some, some references. Okay, any more questions? If not, you will have to hold your piece or uh, contact Ben directly. All right. Well, Ben, thanks again for a really informative talk. Um, I thought they did a great job of, of starting basic before going into a, a really complex amount of equations and, and crazy things going on. Um, so we really enjoyed having you here. And uh, for all of you at attending the seminar series, uh, please join us again next week for Dr. Ch Tammy Giovanelli of Berry College, who will be talking about her work in the impact of uh, or the role of water and uh, people's lives. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah.